Let's just see what Jesus Christ says. Verse 23 says, The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So worship is at the very center of Christianity. Okay? It's who we are as Christians. We are to worship God. And it has different forms, different elements of worship. There is much confusion today of what is true worship. There are some people who say, any way you want to worship God is fine. God doesn't, is not concerned. Well, Jesus says, to worship God, you must worship him in spirit. In other words, led by the spirit of God. And in truth, where does truth come from? The word of God. Okay? Must be in accordance with this book. So, not everything that calls itself worship is worship. You can say it's worship, but that doesn't mean it's worship. Okay? Only if God says it's worship. In fact, right at the very beginning of the Bible, we had false worship and true worship in the very first family. But Cain offered up false worship. Abel offered up true worship. One was accepted by God. The other was rejected by God. Both claimed to be worshiping God. But only one was accepted and one was rejected. So we have to be careful that we understand what real worship is. Now, what does the term worship actually mean? It means it's from an old English word, and it really has the idea of worthy. Okay? He is worthy, or he deserves to be recognized, honored, respected, reverenced in this way. So it's when you are giving God the recognition that he deserves. Okay? When you are honoring him, putting him first, you are worshiping the Lord. Now, one of the best places to see worship is in heaven, isn't it? Because if we're going to find the perfect worship, it's going to be in heaven. Can't get any better than that. There's no sin there. There's no presence of sin there. Everybody's redeemed in heaven. And if you read in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5, we discover that there is continuous worship in heaven. And you'll notice that the worship is united, that the worship is directed to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's honoring him. All those in worship, their eyes are on the Lord, not on themselves. The attention, the star of the show, to use such a term, is not the band leading the worship. It's the one the worship is directed to. So you'll see in the worship in heaven, there's order, there's reverence, there's joy, there's emotion. Okay? And you'll see that what they're speaking. In fact, let's turn to it because I don't, I don't want you to just take my word for it. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 4. Now we're talking about it. Revelation chapter 5. This is the perfect worship service. And it's in heaven. Well, let's take... Revelation 5, verse 12. Verse 11 tells us of Revelation 5 that there are all these people, the elders and the angels, gathered around the throne, 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, millions. And what are they worshiping and saying in their worship? Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. To be slain, that was slain, sorry, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So they're speaking in their worship about the attributes of Jesus Christ. They're showing honor to those attributes. They're magnifying those attributes. And they're not just speaking about one, they're speaking about all different aspects of Jesus Christ. His greatness, his majesty, his power. His wisdom, His glory. And they're singing in verse 9, 
of the same chapter, thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred. They're speaking about salvation. They're worshiping Jesus Christ and saying, you've redeemed us by your blood. They're singing about the blood of the Lamb. They're singing about salvation. They're singing about the glory of God. They're singing about the honor of God, the majesty of God. Now, where are you going to get all those themes? From the word of God. That's from God's word, isn't it? So when you're worshiping God, you are showing God, giving God credit, honor, reverence, ascribing worth to him for all of these things. Okay? And they're all worshiping him together and they fall down before him. There's reverence, isn't there? There's respect. Now, I'm not saying when you come to worship, you have to fall down on your knees. But if you do, well, it's not a, it's not a sin, is it? But what I'm saying is this, it's the attitude where you're coming to God and saying, I'm respecting you. I'm honoring you. I'm submitting to you. That's worship when you have that attitude. When we begin our service here, we sing a verse from the book, I believe, is of Habakkuk. The Lord is in his holy temple. Remember we sing this? Let all the earth keep silence. Now, that doesn't mean let everybody just keep quiet, because then you wouldn't sing. Okay, what does it mean? Let all the earth keep silence. It means let man keep quiet in voicing his opinions. Let's hear God's voice. Okay, it's just a reminder to us as we come to corporate worship that we're here not to hear from us, we're here to hear from God. Okay, let all the work, let all the big talkers outside the door, just keep quiet. We don't need to hear your opinion. We're not here to hear man's opinion. We're here to hear God's opinion, God's word. Okay, let all the earth keep silence. Now, the word worship as it's used in the Bible has two key meanings. Okay, two key aspects. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. It means to give God what he's worth, reverence and honor to his true character, his true attributes. But it can be divided into two words or two aspects. The Greek word, and I give it to you on page two of your notes, proskunio, which means to submit, to bow down. Okay, that's one aspect of the word worship that's translated from the Greek in the New Testament. The other one means to serve the Lord. That's worship when you serve God. Okay, you're worshiping God by serving others. That's part of worship. Okay, so one aspect is submission, bowing. That can mean literally bowing, as in the book of Revelation in heaven, they fall down before the throne of Jesus Christ. Or it can mean the heart of submission, where you come in and say, not my will, but your will. Not my way, your way. Okay? That's worship, when you act like that. Now, those two things have to be present in your worship to be true worship. Or they should be present in your worship. You should have the attitude of reverence, respect, honor of God. And number two, you should want to serve the Lord. That's true worship. When you have the heart of service for others, for the work of God, that's true worship. Okay? Don't set one off against the other. Say, oh, serving is worship, but reverence, you can do it any way you want. No, it has to be done in a humble way with a heart of submission to the Lord himself. It's interesting, the very first reference to worship in the Bible is in Genesis 22. If we go to Genesis 22, it's a story of Abraham and Isaac when Abraham tells Isaac, or takes Isaac, to offer him up as a sacrifice. And he says in verse 5 of Genesis 22, And Abraham said unto his young men, his servants, Abide ye here with the ass, with the animals. And I and the lad, that's Isaac, will go yonder 
and worship and come to you again. Now, where, where were they going or what were they going to do? They were going to Mount Moriah. Today it's where the Temple Mount is in Jerusalem, that area. They were going to that area to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And that's called worship. It's a giving of something. It's an act of worship. Okay? It's a service to God. It's a sacrifice to God. It's called an act of worship. So worship includes your attitude and your actions. Okay? That's what, basically what I'm trying to say. Okay? Towards God. Now let's go a little further. Worship must be towards God in the attitude, in the honor, in the respect, but it must be accompanied, should be accompanied by actions as well. Now, here's some principles. I quickly run through these on page three. The first one seems an obvious one, but people often forget it. The supreme object of worship is God. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve, is what the Bible says. Only God should be worshipped. Nobody else. Often we get mixed up. We say, we need to use worship to attract people. No, that's not the purpose of worship. The purpose of worship is not to get people to come to church. The purpose of worship is to honor God. Okay? No other reason. To honor God. He's the object. He's the one we have to please. Nobody else. He's the one that has to be happy with what we do. Nobody else, ultimately. Now, it's nice if other people like it, but it's not the prime reason. The primary object of worship is God. So, worship is always centered on God. It's adoration and praise to God. And it always should be directed to Him. We should always be thinking that way. So, when you come into the church service today, you should be thinking, I am here to worship God. I'm not here to please anybody around me. Now, it's nice if they join in with me. It's nice if they enjoy the worship together. But that's not the object I'm here for. I'm here as an individual to take time to worship God. Okay? That's the primary and supreme object of worship. So nothing should distract from that. Nothing. That's why in our church we try our best not to distract you with other things in worship. We try to dress in a certain way that doesn't distract you. And people say, wow, very flashy outfit today, huh? <laughs> we try not to have a, a team of young people dancing around half naked to get your attention on the stage or to get a microphone and croon in to the microphone. Because who's then the object of the worship? They become the attraction, not God. We're not here to draw attention to ourselves. We're not here to entertain you. There are places that can entertain you. You can go to the Esplanade Theater. It's a place of entertainment, isn't it? It's a place of performance. But the church is not a place of entertainment. It's not a place of performance. Because we're not here to entertain goats. We're here to worship God. We're here to please God. And a lot of churches have forgotten that. A lot of Christians have forgotten that. And they say to you, can you organize a service that makes me feel good? No, we're not here to organize a service to make you feel good or you feel happy. We're here to organize a service that makes God happy. Amen. See the difference? It's not based around anybody's feelings. It's based about God's feelings about a service. That's worship. Okay? So don't get distracted by those who will tell you, oh, let's try and make the service a service that makes unbelievers comfortable. Why would we want to do that? I don't want unbelievers to feel comfortable in our church. I want them to be uncomfortable. That they know they're sinners. That they know they need to get right with God. I don't want them to come here and say, well, this was just a bit like going to the Esplanade concert. It was very enjoyable. 
And everybody was so nice, and it was so, I think it was, I got a free lunch out of it, and I got a nice cup of tea out of it, and I met some nice friends. That's not what church is about. Now, I hope they did get a nice cup of tea. Okay, we're not against it. But that's not worship. Okay. Now, here's the second point. God's holiness and his perfections, who, his attributes really, are the standards of of our worship. The Bible says this, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Okay? So the focus has got to be in our worship on who God is, how great he is, how marvelous he is, how majestic he is. And the psalmist says, all thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. So Everything about God's creation, everything about God has done, we should use it to praise Him in worship, thank Him in worship, talk about Him in worship. So that's a key element. When you and I are coming to worship, especially in our singing, it should always be describing the attributes of God, the greatness of God. What he has accomplished for us. There should be thanksgiving in it. Now, if you, just to give you an example of this, where's my hymn book? Your hymn book should reflect that, the songs that you sing. If you look at the front of your hymn book, you will see that any good hymn book has got sections in the front of it. And those sections will describe all different aspects of God. There are hymns that speak primarily of praise and worship. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Just speaking directly about God. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. You're just praising God for his holiness. Then there are other hymns, we sung some today, that speak about the incarnation, Jesus Christ. O come all ye faithful. Remember that Christmas carols? That's speaking about Christ coming into the world, born into the womb of a virgin. Then there's hymns that speak of the suffering, the death of Christ. Speak about his atoning love. Speak about his shed blood, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We sing those hymns. Just like the saints in heaven sing, thou hast redeemed us by thy blood. So we should sing about it here on earth. There are other hymns that speak of Christ's second coming. We sung one at the end. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the chosen ones are gathered on the shore beyond the shore. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Speaking of the second coming of Christ. Speaking of heaven. So in worship, we should be speaking and directing our thoughts according to all the attributes of God. Not just some. Now, you can't do it in every service. You can't sing the whole hymn book in every service. Sure you can't. Likewise, you can't preach a sermon in every book of the Bible in every service. Or the service would never end. So you have to do it in sections. You have to sing songs based on the theme of the, the sermon, the chapter of the Bible. In other words, so that the worship is all tied together. The prayer should be reflective of that as well. So that's one aspect of your singing and worship. Here's another one. Go to Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. You found it? Let's read it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Here's another aspect of worship. Teaching one another. When you sing, when you listen to God's word preached, when you listen to God's word read, 
That is meant to teach you something about God. To guide, instruct, correct your life. And that's why if you sing songs that are lightweight, you miss out on learning deeper truths. Isn't that right? But let me illustrate this in a very simple way. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That... Okay, you pretty much got it, haven't you? <laughs> Almost everybody in this room could preach a sermon on John 3.16. Now, if I was to say, this Sunday, today I'm going to preach on John 3.16, everybody would say, okay, that's fine. Then I said, next Sunday I'm going to preach on John 3.16. Then I said, next Sunday after that, I'm going to preach in John 3.16. And for every Sunday, I'm going to preach John 3.16. What would you say after a while? Have you not got the rest of the Bible to preach? <laughs> Is there anything wrong with preaching John 3.16? No. But if you just keep preaching one truth or one verse, you miss out on all the rest. Isn't that right? You miss out on all the Bible. And the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not just some, all of it. And all of it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God might be perfect or fully mature, truly furnished unto all good works. So if you don't have all the balance of Scripture, you lose out. And likewise, when you're singing hymns, you have to sing all types of hymns that teach you all types of truth. You just can't sing from one section all the time because you're losing out some of the teaching from other hymns. You understand what I'm saying? And if you sing hymns that have no great meaning to it, you know, I hear a lot of these songs today and it's, Lord, I love you. Okay, nothing wrong with it. Then the next verse goes, Lord, I love you. The next line, Lord, I love you. Now, what's happened? You've just sung the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. There's nothing wrong with the statement, Lord, I love you. But if that's all you sing, you're missing out on so much more teaching through the hymns and the songs. Isn't that right? We call those type of songs 7-Eleven. You know the 7-Eleven downstairs? <laughs> Seven words repeated 11 times. So what should a good hymn, for example, a good sermon be? It's one that takes some theme and then builds upon the theme and then adds more and more. So let's take one, the most famous song, Amazing Grace. Okay? Let's look at Amazing Grace. Many of you here could repeat it word for word. 247 in your book, Amazing Grace. Just to illustrate this. Now, here's what John Newton does in Amazing Grace. This is why it's such a great hymn. It says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. See. Now, this is speaking about John Newton before he was saved, wasn't it? I once was blind. But now, I see. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. Now, is that good, is that good doctrine? Yeah, it is. It's good truth, isn't it? But if John Newton just kept getting up every Sunday and telling how he got saved, everybody said, hey, you all heard this a thousand times. <laughs> can we not sing another verse? Is that all you can sing about? But look at the next few stanzas. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed so he's given us something more about the grace of God how the grace of God convicted him and spoke to him but again he's still talking about how he was converted notice the next stanza number three through many dangerous toils and snares I have already come tis grace has brought me safely sir and grace will lead me home. Ah, 
He's now building upon his salvation. Grace saved him, but grace didn't leave him there. You see what he's saying? He's saying God's grace has now kept him through many dangers, toils, snares, temptations, problems. He says, I have already come. Tis grace, or it is grace, that has brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me all the way home. Grace is still working in my life. So he's telling us something about the truth of God's grace, isn't he? That's different from the other two stanzas. So he's giving you and I more doctrine. That's what he's doing. He's teaching us more truth through this song. But let's go on to the next verses. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. Ah, he's now teaching us that God, our assurance of salvation is tied to the word of God, the promise of God. He's now dealing with another aspect of truth, the assurance of salvation. You see what he's doing here? He just doesn't keep repeating, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and keep repeating it over and over and over again. He's building upon it like a house, one block at a time. Now, he starts with salvation because that's where you start. He then moves to God's grace, keeping him today. He then teaches us about how we have assurance of salvation today. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. God's God's there all of my life, not just some of my life, not just at the beginning of my salvation. He's there to keep me all my days. And then if you go to verse 5, he says, The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. The God who called me here below will be forever mine. He's changed the whole theme again, isn't he? He's now telling us, our possessions on earth will disappear. Don't get too attached to them. Don't let your possessions possess you. He's telling the Christian. Everything's going to dissolve one day. Everything's going to burn up one day. And he says, but God is not going to burn up. He will be forever mine. You see what he's doing? He's building theological truth. He's teaching us truth as we sing this hymn. What's his last stanza? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. In other words, he's taking us now into eternity. And he says, God's grace is just as true then as it is now. The same grace that saved us has kept us and will keep us in eternity future. So John... Newton, in that song, has fulfilled the purpose of writing a good worship song. He has taught us many truths. You understand? Now, I know when you sing some of these hymns, they can be difficult. can be difficult. But you've got to persevere because they're full of biblical truth. And the more you know of them, the more they'll teach you. Let me give you a simple analogy that helps... Let me help you to understand this. You can go downstairs to McDonald's and have your breakfast there and have your lunch there and have your dinner there. And you can go there on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Will you die? Yes. No. <laughs> now, you might die prematurely from eating too much. But will you survive? Will it provide enough nourishment for you to survive on this earth? Yes, it will. There are people who've been eating McDonald's every day for years and years and years, and they're surviving. You won't die. What will happen? You will be malnutrition. You'll have malnutrition because you won't get all the things that you need in the McDonald's food for a healthy body. But you'll survive. You won't die from eating a Big Mac every day. You might die from a heart attack when you're younger, but you'll, still, you'll live a few years. You won't die straight away. Okay? But if you go to in a sal restaurant, uh, pick a good restaurant. Mark says yes. And you eat all those vegetables and all those potatoes and the beef and the chicken. and the, Don't eat the pork, but eat all the healthy stuff. 
you'll be a lot healthier. Will you still survive? Yeah. But will you be surviving in a more healthy state? Yes, you will, because you're eating a more balanced diet. And likewise, if you sing a song in worship that just speaks about one truth of God over and over and over again, will it do you any harm? No, it won't do you any harm, because it's true. Anything about God is true is good for you. Isn't that right? But it won't strengthen you. It won't build you up. If I preach the same sermon every week, will it be good for you? Yes, but it won't build you any further. See what I'm trying to say? You'll be spiritually malnutrition. You'll suffer from spiritual malnutrition if you don't go deeper in the things of God. If you hear the same themes over and over and over again, you lose out. God doesn't lose out because God's still God. But you will lose out. Okay, so worship must be something that teaches you each time, takes you deeper each time in truth. Then the other aspect of it, if you go back to Colossians chapter 3, Paul tells us, verse 16 and 17. Colossians 3, 16. He says, teaching, and what's the next word? And admonishing. What's admonishing? It's encouraging, exhorting, telling people, come on, you know, rise up, be a man for God, be a woman for God. Don't live this way, live better. And part of worship is to encourage those around you to be better Christians. You know, even some of our hymns reflect that. You know, we sang hymns like, stand up, stand up for Jesus. You remember that hymn? Ye soldiers of the cross. That's a hymn that primarily admonishes us to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing hymns like, throw out the lifeline, the gospel lifeline to sinners. That's encouraging all of us to go out and tell others about Jesus Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Climb the hills and cross the waves. Onward is our Lord's command. Jesus saves. That's telling us, go out and tell others. Go everywhere and tell others. The sermons should have that element to them as well. When the sermons are preached, the word of God not only teaches you, not only praises God for who God is, but the sermons should also tell you, you should live better. You should be better. You should have a better marriage. You should have a, a better work-life balance. You should have a better attitude towards others. You understand what I'm saying? So there's that element. There's the praising God for his attributes. There's a teaching element. And there's this admonishing element in worship. Okay? And all of it should be there. And if you come to our services, not just on one Sunday, but over many Sundays, God willing, you should receive the balance of that. Okay, in the way we preach, in the passages we read, in the songs that we sing, they should be teaching you, they should be strengthening you, they should be nourishing you, they should be encouraging you, they should be correcting you, and they should always be praising God, honoring God as well. All of those things. Okay, that's worship. That's all part of worship. Now, third thing is this. Our worship is to reflect God's person by demonstrating reverence and order. Now this is always one that you have to be careful you don't go over the top. But what do we mean demonstrate reverence and order? God is not your buddy. Okay? When the service is over, you talk to your neighbor, your friend. Well, that's your friend, isn't it? It's your buddy. It's informal. You can use pet names, pet terms, one towards the other. That's what we mean by informality, isn't it? But God is to be approached with reverence, the Bible says. He's not like you and I. The Bible says he's a great king. He's not just a king. He's a great king. You don't come in to see the president of the Philippines or the president of Singapore and walk in and say, hey, how you doing? 
in a pair of old flip-flops and shorts and throw yourself down on the chair and say, hey, can you get me, some, get me a cup of tea? That's not how you would approach that situation, would it? That would be a lack of reverence, a lack of respect. I mean, you, you don't even need to be a Christian to understand this. And likewise, when you come into the presence of God in worship, you're not to come into God's presence the same way you're going to meet your pals for a cup of tea after the service. You're to come in with an attitude of, I am coming to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I am coming to show him the respect and honor he deserves. And the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you prepare yourself before you come in should reflect that. Even the way you come on time to the service. I don't understand these people who come late. Now, some of you use public transport, and it's not always the best in Singapore. I understand that. You have an excuse. Some of you, your employers don't release you in time. I understand that. You have an excuse. It's not your fault. But if you have time and you come late, what are you saying to God? It doesn't matter about you. That's what you're saying. Not important. It's just something incidental to my life. Just throw him a few minutes. In fact, I give him long enough. Would you do that if the prime minister was here? If the president was here? Of course you wouldn't. Because you would want to be there to show respect for a human. Well, how much more respect should you show for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? It says all about your values. It says all about your heart of worship, if that's the way you view God. And you and I are to worship him with the reverence and the order that he deserves. We're to sing the hymns and think about the words we're singing. Not sing in an empty way where we don't care what we're singing. We're thinking about what I'm going to do after the service, what I'm going to do tomorrow. That's not showing him reverence, is it? Or when the Bible's being read, your mind is drifting onto other things. That's not showing respect or reverence to God, is it? That's disorderliness. That's irreverence. And the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. That's a powerful image, isn't it? He's a consuming fire. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul told the Christians there that all things be done decently and in order. Now, there's one thing I must say Singaporeans are very good at generally. is orderliness, isn't it? You've got to give them credit. If you're going to pick a country in the world that's the most orderly, this is right up there with number one or two. And most Singaporean churches reflect that order because... When they lift the offering, the ushers are well ordered, the weekly is there, there's people giving out things at the door. Generally, they run it in an orderly way. That's good. That's the way it should be. Okay? It shouldn't be just, oh, well, I think today we'll just lift the offering. Anybody feel, anybody around could do it? Huh? What about you? And the person come up there in the flip-flops, you know. <laughs> Where's the basket, you know? Okay, well, hold on. Let me get a bag here. Throw it into the bag. Is that done decently in an order? That's done disorderly, isn't it? So it doesn't matter, by the way, it's, it's not important whether you lift it with a bag, whether the usher has a tie or doesn't have a tie. Do it. What we're saying is the attitude and the action must be done decently and in order. Because this is God. It's not man. This is showing him the honor that he deserves. And he is owed from us. And God is not the author of confusion, the Bible says, but of peace. Not the author of confusion. Anytime you see disorderly behavior, it's not coming from God. It's coming from the devil. Now, here's the fourth thing. God forbids his people to imitate the ungodly ways of worship. So you and I are not to borrow from all these other religions and all these other activities in society and borrow their ideas of how to worship God. We don't do that. We are not going to make this a nightclub. Okay? It's not a nightclub. We're not here to imitate the nightclub. They, they do their job. That's their activities. We're not here even to imitate the concerts. 
you know, with all these orchestras and they have these classical musicians with a conductor. We're not here to imitate them either. They're doing a performance to entertain people. We're not here to do that. We're here to worship God, to give him the honor that's due to him. Here's another one. Worship services are to be done in a solemn and a joyful way. Now, a lot of people are good at the solemn part, but not the joyful part. In heaven, they're singing reverentially, but they're singing joyfully. Isn't that right? And you should sing joyfully from your whole heart. You know, you shouldn't be, amazing grace. I mean, if you're an unsaved person, came in here and you listen to some of these people, you'd wonder, why are you so, so unamazed by amazing grace? There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus. And you look at their face. They look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. All right. No. Solemn, yes. Reverential, yes. But joyful. Sing with your whole heart. Don't be ashamed. Number six, it's primarily designed for believers. Don't get this in your mind that this church service is to try and bring unsaved people in. No, we're not. We're, we're glad that they come. We're happy that they come. But that's not the primary reason for this church. The church is here as a gathering of God's people to worship God. Okay? Now, we do occasionally have services that we set aside to reach unbelievers. Like we have the gospel service at 3 p.m. That's one of the key functions of that service. But that's a secondary service. It's not the main service that we have in this place. So the main service is to honor God for the people of God. And that's why we don't need to try and tempt people to come in here. Because we're not here to entice unbelievers in. I said this last time. If you want to fill this place every Sunday, three or four times, you just need to entice them in. Isn't that right? Give out the Starbucks voucher. Give out the Jollibee voucher. They'll all be here. People say, well, just bring in the big uh, live rock and roll band. Even more are coming. Well, that's true. I say, well, if they come in and they all take their clothes off, even more will come. If that's the end, justifies the means. If that's you're trying to get the biggest crowd, you'll you get them in. But we're not here to get the biggest number in. We're here to worship God. We're here to please Him. We're here to have a place of sanctuary and rest for God's people to come here, shut themselves away from the world, and focus on God and worship God. That's the primary purpose of this church. And we try our best to do that. We're not perfect at it. But we try our best to do it. Now, worship is not just a weekly event, but it should be done throughout the week. Every day should be a time of worshiping God. Every activity, you should be worshiping God. Martin Luther says, the dairy maid milking the cows should do it for the glory of God. Washing the dishes, you can worship God while washing the dishes. Doing it for the glory of God. Sweeping the floor. Working in the office. Your whole life is to be dedicated to the worship of God. And worship includes all of these things, reading the Bible, singing hymns, praying, giving of your tithes and offerings, taking of the sacraments, preaching, listening to God's word, working in the office, working in the home. All of these things can be done for the glory of God, can be done to worship God. Okay? When you come here on Sunday, it's just corporate worship. What do you mean by the word corporate? God's people coming together corporately, one big group. But when you go out the door, you can still worship God as the individual. Worship Him by serving others. Worship Him by doing your job to the glory of God that He gave you. Worshiping Him by being a blessing to others, praying for others. Okay? Your whole life should be a life of worship. Don't get this idea in your mind on Sunday. I come to worship for two hours. Then that's over. Worship finished. I'll see you next week, God. That's what some people think. No. 
The corporate worship may be over for another week. But the individual worship goes on every moment of every day in your life. Okay? That's giving God honor, service by serving others. Didn't he tell us to go into all the world? Yeah, he did. Didn't he tell the husbands and the wives to live together the right way? Yes, he did. That's serving him by doing that. Didn't he tell us who are employees to serve our employers? Yeah, he did. Didn't he tell us who are citizens of the country to submit to the government of the country and serve the government of the country? Yes, he did. So by doing that, we're honoring him and his word. We're worshiping him. The whole life is a life of worship. One last question. If, or shouldn't say if, since worship is the highest calling for you and I as Christians, how are you doing? How would you, what would you give yourself out of ten for the last seven days in worshiping God? If you say, oh, five, four, <laughs> oh dear, two, some even say one. That's sad, isn't it? And everything we do, we have to give an account for at the end of our lives. We're only here for such a short time. Make your life one that means something in worshiping the Lord. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Make sure your life does that every day. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for your instructions about worship, that it must be done reverently, holily, solemnly, orderly, when we're here together as a corporate people. But it always must honor you. It always must teach each and every one of us great things about who God is. It should always admonish us to live better. It should always lead us to serve others better. That's worship. Help us to live lives of worship, not just here on a Sunday, but on a Monday, and a Tuesday, and a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday, and a Saturday as well. Not just in the church, but in the home. Not just in the home, but the workplace. Wherever you put us, may our hearts be full of worship to the God we adore. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>